I think it's important the behavior change and and I had one guest uh, I don't remember now which guest was saying but that the for example the behavior change in smoking cessation they are really doing a good job how it's put into clinical practice and it works really well but that we are not using the same learning same same scientific knowledge of behavior change in physical activity so I think this there's a lot to learn that we learn from different sciences or different disciplines, maybe pain science, there's something which is done good and we should actually bring it to physical activity and maybe vice vice versa. Absolutely. Like that is 100% my motivation for chatting with you today is there is so much for me to learn and hopefully I can share something helpful that translates from pain. But I think the all these different areas of research need to be collaborating and discussing ideas across conditions because it's similar. Like a lot of it relies on the same types of interventions. Um, mm. I, I can send you a link. I read a recent study in Nature where they did this thing called a mega study and they were trying to get people to go to gyms. Did you have you seen this? It's about no. so they gave they did like fifty something, fifty four different interventions, um, and so it was all part of the one study. And there's a really clear protocol. And they said like so if someone attends the gym, they get twelve cents in their bank account, and and if someone gets a the gym, they get a gold star, and if someone gets a the gym, they do. And there's all these different rewards and different disciplines and different things. And they did all these different controlled trials, and then they cumulatively put the results together and said this is what actually works and what doesn't work and then at the same time they got a panel of experts to say this is what we think works and this is what will work and predict and and basically everyone overestimated what they think will work and they were also wrong about what they thought would work Um, and so one of the beauties of international collaborations like this and big data sets is that we can start doing a better job of comparing one intervention with other interventions, with control groups, with shams, with like, and 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 it's not just like, oh, I'm going to change my outcome measure because I didn't find a result. Like we're pre-registering protocols and, and like the bar for research is getting higher, which is awesome. Um, but also the methodology is improving and our ability to even like, like I, I'm involved in a, a multiple baseline study where you collect data and you see if we can get, a stable concept of pain, like using my questionnaire. And then we intervened with a sham education book where we taught them what we thought we taught them was nothing. Um, This paper, we're writing it up at the moment. I'll share a little bit about it, but not too much. So we thought we were giving a sham education. And then two weeks later, they keep filling out the questionnaire and then they get the real book. And and we blinded assessors, we blinded the the, um, participants. And what we thought would happen is concept of pain scores would stay steady And then when the intervention came, then they would change. But the sham shouldn't change scores. Um, But in reality, I think it's it's much messier than that. And and some of the questions in the outcome measure are about the role of the brain um, when pain persists. And because the sham book just mentions the word brain, it's potentially causing self-reflection. And so we did interviews just after those two interventions and some of the kids are learning from filling out the questionnaire. That I went up, I went away and looked up that word, and and I, I asked my mum about that book afterwards. And and so they're act, like, we tried not to teach them with the sham. We we tried not to, but um, I think there's this element of going. Well, how do we like now? That's a pilot study. Like, if we go into a school and we're going to run a big randomized control trial, how do we create a really good control group? And and so like in terms of designing these behavioral interventions i think as if i put my researcher hat on i think we need to do a really really good job up front and make sure that the bias is minimal and we're going to find out what's effective and what's not effective um but then as a clinician and as an educator i think we want to be able to make sure we're not over claiming oh this is amazing um if it's not amazing and and so the one of the big things that is changing in, in clinical practice is people are relying a lot less on p-values and they're reporting effect sizes. And this is brilliant because you're actually finding out how much, how effective is it? Rather than just saying education works, you're saying um, a, a real education book versus a sham book does this and, and it's quantifiable and you're actually contributing to the conversation. Whereas if you're saying education's great, it, it doesn't, really translate to anything and and it's like no one knows what you're talking about and how great and who's great and greater than what and um and so i think 
if we can be more specific in our conversations. Um, but that takes time and, and learning. And, and I think we're just at an exciting time in terms of health science research. Like it's, it's like medicine like skyrocketed 30, 40 years ago. And it feels like the physio profession and, and the associated kind of um, health professions are all changing so rapidly. And it's really exciting to be a part of. Um, mm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I said before we started the recording that we have this kind of few bullet points that we go and I said that we probably go a different way and, and I think now we have discussed 50 minutes and I I haven't covered the second bullet point at all. Totally so fine. Just, I don't mind at all. Yeah, yeah, just thinking how to how to go. But this has been really interesting discussions about science communications, behavior change. Maybe we go quickly to the one of the main points that we plan to discuss the pain science and maybe we could look at from the point of view we have uh, health and fitness professionals as listeners also they might be athletic coaches physiotherapists personal trainers so what do they need to know about pain science and how they can use that knowledge in their in their practice yeah, there there is a lot to be honest. I think I could talk about this for days. Um, I'll like maybe just share one example, and then I can, if people are interested, I can share more resources and things. Um, so if someone grows up and they they graze their knee a little bit and have a little bit of pain, and then they fall over again and it hurts more, there's more damage. People start um, subconsciously and, and just kind of implicitly developing these beliefs that more damage will mean more pain and that can be the case like there are some conditions where that's common but particularly when when pain persists and in like athletic populations or people at the gym they often they're people who are overdoing it and just smashing it all the time even if it's sore um and and i think it can get really complicated like so what are the drivers for the pain to persist is it that the tissue is still damaged um, potentially that has a role and, and but, but we see all these other psychosocial factors coming in and, and there's so much research looking at all of these different contributors and I don't think many of them are like contributing 20% or anything like that. I think the numbers are pretty small but there are just so many biopsychosocial factors influencing um, and even in like controlled lab studies of acute pain, um, the numbers aren't it's not clear cut that pain means more damage means more pain. And I, I think that's a really helpful message to start thinking about because if someone's like a fitness professional, for instance, um, and they're, they start exercising, it's like they're going for it and then they feel pain come on. If they have the belief that pain means there's something that's damaged, they will stop and they will, if their beliefs are that they should lay down or rest or whatever it is, they will do that. Um, whereas like if they think that motion is lotion and that they should lubricate the joint by doing some gentle movements or whatever it is, they're going to behave differently. And, and then if, or if they reconceptualize pain, which is what I'm encouraging and I think should happen, if they start thinking about pain as a, um, a, a threat detector and, and a protective feeling that you feel um, rather than a damage meter it's about protection and like how how safe do I need to be kept right now um, and so if you're going for a run and there's a bear chasing you and you sprain your ankle you'll keep running and it'll be fine um, but if you aren't don't have the bear there and you sprain your ankle you'll stop running and and I think it's that idea of going well what's most important and what's most advantageous right now for my system and so there's an element of kind of listening to your body a little bit, but then at the same time, if you do an assessment and and it is safe to move, then you need to engage in in movement. I think the best one of the best treatments we have available in an acute and chronic pain setting is is keeping things gently moving and gradually building back up. Um, and that that's. I think reasonably important in everyone, but in a person with a persistent pain condition of any kind, I think that becomes critical. And if they stop moving and if they start changing their behaviors accordingly, they go down this spiral and what the next step is fear. Um, this is the most common thing that you'll see coming into a clinic. They, I just can't bend anymore or I can't do this, whatever the movement is. Can't That joint doesn't do that anymore. And when you ask what they, what you mean, it, they're afraid, and it's please do not do it. It's a horrible pain, or whatever whatever the the symptoms are. 
and fear then leads to avoidance and there's a really nice some great um psychology work on fear avoidance model um and i think that spiral leads to worse and worse outcomes and it's quite hard to get out of um but education i think is the starting point to that and so if you understand and you truly understand how robust your body is how resilient it is how adaptable it is um then you can start changing the way that your system responds um i think i there was a few a few years ago i was going for a run had knee pain and we had a newborn baby and my first thought like from doing all this research work my first thought was oh it's just because i've had a bad sleep <laughs> um, and if you told me that 5 years earlier i w- there's no way i'd even think about sleep as a contributing factor to knee pain during a run um whereas uh, i think i i went too far and I, I attributed the knee pain only to sleep um but there's a tension and there's a balance there to think about okay why why is my system primed to be protecting me more well i'm in a really like tired state um like that's going to contribute and if your diet's poor and all these different things are going to contribute to how much protection your body needs um so that's like i guess one really kind of one key message is that pain is not a a damage meter mm. um and and i think that's helpful for yeah for everyone but then also for particularly for people who have pain that that lasts longer than it takes for the tissues to heal um yeah i, I like the other the other concept that comes to mind um is a newer kind of theory that's only recently being applied to pain um and it's predictive processing so this is where the brain is predicting how much um, threat there is at the level below it, which is the spinal cord. And and if if there's threat detected, it will adapt and it will act to protect the spinal cord. And then at the next level down, like I'll just oversimplify it for you, mm-hmm. this, just for the sake of brevity, the spinal cord is then protecting the periphery. And if it detects threat, then it will adapt and it will act to, to try and keep the periphery safe. Like if you put your hand on a hot stove, it, you will have at a super spinal level, you'll, you'll pull your hand away really quickly. So there's motor responses. There's all sorts of great stuff happening. It's a really impressive system. Then the periphery is detecting what's going on around you. And, and we know with peripersonal space research that like the bubble in front of your face is much more protected than like behind your heel, for instance, you don't even really notice what's there. And, and if someone jumps in that space, no one cares. But if someone jumps in your face or, or has something sharp in that space, it can be um, it can cause a pain response in, in people with CRPS and all sorts of different conditions. Um, and so there's these levels of the nervous system and the surrounding environment that are being predicted um, to know how, like, sorry, predictions are happening at each of those levels and the, the system is constantly adapting and changing. So... Um, I don't know, a really quick example. If you're sitting in the park, having a great time, all the predictions at each level are, this is safe, there's no threats. And then suddenly a toxin enters your thumb, like you get stung by a bee or something. Um, a, a message goes up saying that there's there's a threat in, in this part of your periphery. Um, and then your eyes send a message saying there's, there's a bee there. Um, it starts swelling and you look at it, you've pulled it away, you've taken out the stinger, all those different things are happening. And your system, all, like there are all these quick adaptations of knowing what's happening. And then if a whole swarm of bees come, the prediction would be like, we need to get out of here. Um, whereas if you don't really have much of a reaction, then it probably wouldn't wouldn't be a problem. And, and I like to think if you were attributing this, like so with chronic pain, I don't know, a classic movement would be um, bending forward and, and reaching down towards the ground. People think their discs are going to pop out like some really crazy misconception. Like we know that discs do not slide and slip and all of that, but um, there's a common societal belief that they are. And and so if someone thinks that they're going to avoid bending over and if you can provide them the education that um, you could explain expectations, like it's hurt you the last like 9,999 times you bent over, it hurt. Um, before you even do it next time, like the 10,000th time, do you think it's going to hurt? Um, they will like, there is not even hesitation. They'll say, yes, definitely. Like I've got, my discs will slide out. Like they, they have such a, a strongly connected anecdotal biased, wrong belief. <laughs> it, it's not factually true. Um, like the system does not need to protect you with pain when you bend over. Um, and 
And it's a really interesting tension. Like it's like, do you confront that belief head on? How do you get alongside them? How like do you need to replace that belief, or can you just break it down a little bit and maybe they'll be okay? Um, there's all these questions that go through your mind. So this is pain science education, and if I've sold anyone on it, um, I'm happy to chat more. But it, it, I guess there's so many degrees of complexity, and I, it's about how do we tailor that for the person that you're you're encouraging to learn. It's not the person you're teaching. It's the person who's going to, to try um, doing the learning. And, um, and so in the questionnaire that I developed, the, the concept of pain inventory, what's nice about that is you can look at the trend in a clinical setting. If someone's ticked, agree, 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 and then there's one disagree and then agree, 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 or something like that. At the end, you can say, oh, like, interesting. Like, I wonder why did you disagree with this question that learning about pain can help you feel less pain? Well, there's no way that learning is going to change how much pain I'm in or like, or they might say, I've never thought about it, but I don't think it could be true. Um, you can gauge, are they willing to learn? Are they interested? What exactly are they hung up on? Um, like what do their family think about that? You can get straight to the point. So rather than me going through and explaining pain doesn't mean damage, pain's a protector, I don't know, predictive processing, or like lots of different messages, central sensitization, all these different cool things you can get straight to where's their gap in their knowledge and their beliefs or where's their misconception. And I think that is another translatable skill that could be potentially offered here. So like if someone, when you're doing this um, sit less, move more education, um, like I agree with that. I don't know how well I live it out. Like I get prompts on my watch to stand up. I sometimes obey the watch. <laughs> um, but like, so if you could tap into and understand what are my explicit beliefs and what do I think I know? And then what also like implicitly what's happening? If you can assess my behaviors in some way um, that tap into those subconscious things that I just do, um, like I love writing and if I'm in the zone, I'll just keep right. I'll ignore the watch or whatever. Um, if you can kind of tap into what are those beliefs that are causing the, the lack of behavior change, um, then you can address those head on. And most of the time, like working with kids, particularly in this age, 8 to 12, where my focus is, um, they're not often totally aware that they've even changed the way they think. And so the parents like, oh, yeah, little Johnny is thinking completely differently. And then you ask Johnny. He's like, no, nah, I didn't learn anything. It's a waste of time or whatever. And, but, he, but then the clinical observation is he's behaving differently. He's thinking differently, but he's just not aware of that. And so one of the questions that we're just starting to tackle in this field is going, do we need the person to the learn? Does the learner need to be aware of the learning? And maybe for lifelong learning, if that's necessary, we want them to be aware so that then they progress and keep learning more. But maybe for some people, they don't need to be aware of it. And, um, and I think the other mistake we can make is over-educating. Like we can say, oh, well, everyone needs to know this message of move more, sit less. I don't know. I'm just picking that one because mm -hmm. you mentioned it. Yeah, um, that's good. But like, does everyone need to hear that message? And does everyone need to completely change their behavior? Probably not. There's probably a lot of people who are healthy enough and it's not bothering them. Their quality of life is already really good. It's not like telling them this extra message is not going to change their life. Um, and we don't know how big that group of people are, but there are probably people like that. Like for me with the pain world, I've had patients, their their outcomes are outstanding um, and they come to you and they say something that clearly demonstrates they haven't understood a word that you've said. <laughs> um, and, and you're just like, oh, well, <laughs> um, like they didn't, the education was not the mediator of their change, but um, for everyone else in the group, they're all saying about how helpful the animations were and the ex explanations and different things. So um, I think that's another factor is to think who is the target audience? Like, is it every single person on earth? Um, is it a subset of that? And, and how small is that subset? Because um, that's going to influence what we do. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And I, I think it was interesting when you said about like, if you expect to have pain when you do something, you really pay attention to it and you, oh, yeah. you will probably feel. And I think this similar, I had quite a bit earlier uh, episode with Professor Amanda Reber, and she's talking about automatic evaluations in relation to exercise, mainly that if you think that it will suck, it will probably suck. But if you think that it will be great. It will be probably great. Like, 
And I've been I've been thinking this when I sometimes go, for example, for a run. You feel a little bit stiff in the beginning. Maybe you, before you warm up, you feel tired. You don't feel good. And if I would believe those early feelings, I would think that running sucks. But I have experienced it many times that actually, if you just keep going after 20 minutes, it probably starts to feel really good. And yeah. and when you finish, it's actually great. But I think right, in, yeah. in many things we have these automatic evaluations, which kind of define what what will we think what what we do in a way. Yeah, awesome. And I think that's a really good example of if you're going to create long-term behavior change, you have inbuilt in yourself some resilience of going, okay, even if I'm having a bad day, I'll still run for 20 minutes because it'll feel good eventually. Um, yeah. And creating that kind of like that backup plan of going, even on the bad days, I know that in the long term, the habit is worth it. Um, and you need to, like the person needs to be completely sold on that because if without the habit, the long-term outcomes aren't there and they can have some great runs and they can do some fantastic stuff. But unless you're exercising regularly, you're not going to see those cumulative benefits. Um, I, I just, yeah, the, the principle of like compound interest in this sort of stuff is just unbelievable. Like if you, I read, I did this uh, maths the other day. If you do 1.02 to the power of, 365. So if you increase by 2% per day, the, the answer is like 38 or something like that. And, and so like, it's tight, like 2% from pain point of view, your nervous system wouldn't even notice a 2% change. I don't reckon like it's pretty, pretty amazing, but 2% is tiny. Like if you're doing a hundred reps, that's doing 102, like that's nothing, no mm. difference. Um, and so like in step count, that's nothing. In in all these different measures, like the number of minutes sitting or standing, 2% is not much. But if you're increasing or changing that daily and you're sticking with that plan, um, your system will come into line with that. Like we say, or, or like on, across the top of everyone's tracking sheets, I think tracking is a, is a helpful strategy, by the way. Um, if it says, it says stick to the plan, not to the pain. And so we we get find out people's baseline, we take 20% off, and they should be having a pretty good week. Like they're they're doing less than their baseline. Um, and if they get pain, then that's when they first start implementing that message of stick to the plan, not to the pain. And so for you, when you went for that run and it wasn't great, you're sticking to the plan and not to the crappy expectations and feelings that you had, because you know cognitively <laughs> that you are being wrong you're biased at the moment towards not wanting to do it and i think um that's the cool like that's the empowering thing of this kind of learning is it's life-changing it's like you are you're getting to do more than what an average human without that knowledge could do because everyone else would just stop doing stuff like oh i'm having a bad day that means i shouldn't bother um, like that's the default, right? And and so we're changing the default and that's so cool. Like, I don't know, it's really mm. good that you're able to stick to a habit even when it's hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I start to feel many pains, so I need to. But but <laughs> maybe, maybe before we finish, let's, let's take one example. Like I think quite many listeners are somehow related to trying to activate inactive people. And, yeah. and basically when you start, even standing more uh, or moving more, exercising, you will feel some pain. How could they prepare these people? How could they educate them? What would be the guideline? I think this was great that you you follow the plan, not the not the pain. What kind of yeah. things they could tell to these people when they are starting? Because there definitely will be some pain. Yeah, yeah. There is a brilliant diagram in in the book called Explain Pain, and it has it's called the Twin Peaks model, and it has two mountains, and it shows you before chronic pain. Um, when if you were climbing a mountain, there's a line at which it's called the protect by pain line, and I, I hope I do this diagram justice. If any of the authors are listening, um, but and pain will come on well before tissue damage, so it's a protective thing. You'll feel pain if you keep pushing. That's okay. You're not going to cause any damage, but there'll be a point at which your tissue tolerance is no more and you would cause an injury. So say like you can go this far up and then if you go any further, that's okay. It will hurt. But then if you go beyond that, it's kind of like you're going to damage something or like it's like superhuman kind of amazingness. 
Um, and that gap is kind of the buffer between pain and, and damage happening. And then in chronic pain, what happens is the first line of protection is so much lower. It's at the bottom of the mountain, right? So you're just getting started and you're already getting the pain really, really early. And then the gap between pain and tissue damage is so much bigger. Um, so the, the tissue tolerance has dropped from the first mountain, but only a little bit. And so you've got pain coming on really early. The buffer here is enormous. <laughs> Um, and then you're not going to cause an injury until you get this far. Um, and then you would cause damage right up the top bit again. And I think like for me, the mo that's the most compelling model and example I can um, show someone. Like I have that book just sitting out on the bench and you just tell it, you can quickly explain that to patients and you can say, this is where you are right now. Like this is you. Um, and both both are true. Like even the, the acute pain model is really helpful to think, Pain is coming on well before tissue damage. How am I responding to it? What's influencing it? But then in the in the chronic pain state, like the, the persistent pain state, pain is coming on much earlier, but the buffer is enormous. Mm. And you can give someone that, that um, encouragement that it's sore but safe. And, mm. and, and that message is a really sticky one. Like you, you don't forget that. And you can the person starts building some evidence within themselves. Like this is coming back to the story thing, right? Like they start seeing actually change is possible. I'm accumulating little wins here. Like I, I am sore, but I know that I'm not damaging anything. And and I think once um, once you've empowered someone to, to experiment in this way and to engage in graded exposure, like that's ultimately what we're doing here is pacing and graded exposure. Um if they think they're nudging into an overprotective buffer, <laughs> that's so much better because that's like too much of a good thing. Whereas if they think they're damaging their ligaments and they're spraining muscles or whatever, or breaking bones or fracturing stuff, anytime they feel that, they're immediately thinking, I am getting worse because of this. Whereas if they feel a little bit of pain over here, <laughs> um, they're thinking I am getting better despite my pain. Mm. And and that is such a critical change in thinking. And and often, I would say most patients I saw in the five years of running gr in group settings, there's the peer pressure and all of those influences that help as well. It's it's about two weeks. The people do not want to come. They hate it. <laughs> um, it's really really hard. They're having lots of flare ups. Their sleep's horrible. They they can't set goals. They're depressed. Like there's all these things going on, and then they come and at week four they say to you, Josh, why didn't you tell me that this works at the start? <laughs> um, and and because they've now seen the evidence, and they're like, why didn't you tell me about this mountain? And why didn't you tell me about the the castle video, like the mysterious signs of pain. Why didn't you show me all these things in week one? And I literally go back in the book. And I'm like, we did. You you learned this, <laughs> but, but your blinkers were on, and you like pain was so overwhelming. And and I think that's some of this education is it needs to persist beyond those barriers. Like people do have enormous barriers up, and and it's and it's not their fault. Like it's it's conditioning. It's it's what they've grown up with. It's there's a lot of health professionals providing bad advice or non evidence based advice. Um, so there's lots of barriers here to conceptual change, and then there's more barriers to behavior change. Um, and I just I just think yeah, in my career, I hope to get to the point where we see generational conceptual change, like the equivalent of now everyone wears a hat and sunscreen in Australia. I want to see. Now everyone understands that pain is complicated and they're willing to nudge into that protective buffer, like something like that. I'd love to look back at this podcast and think, gee, that like we did it. <laughs> um, but I don't know if we'll get there. It's a, it's a lofty goal. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's good. And maybe I, I give some, some other resources for listeners. So if you're interested about this pain, pain concepts, especially in relation to running, you can check the episode with Prody Sharp. He's, he's the podcast host of Run Smarter. I had a recording with him maybe a month ago, and then related to osteoarthritis pain, how to how to notice whether your pain is kind of muscle soreness or it's actually joint pain. There's an episode with uh, Professor David Hunter. So if, you, if you're interested to hear about these more, maybe you can check those. 
And before we finish finish up this, uh, would you like to promote some of your resources? Where do you want to direct people? Where they can find your book and and so on? Oh yeah, I mean, um, yeah, like I don't really care. Like, as in, I'm happy to share resources and things. Um, I don't want to make money out of you or anything like that. It's um, if people want to access these resources, most of it is all free online and um. Other than that, the, anything that costs money, like the kids' books will cost money, but the money is going back into more resource development and, and um, stuff like that. So, it, and it costs a lot of people, like creative people aren't, they don't work for free or for exposure. Um, and I, I think, um, yeah, anyway, that's a side side note. But basically, um, I, yeah, I have a website and if you just go to that website so we can, I can share it with you. It's just joshuawpate.com. I'll like post updates there and, um, there's, you can subscribe to get an email when it, when everything's, um, coming out. Um, and there's a list, like I update all my papers as they're coming out. Um, and yeah, on Twitter is most commonly the social media platform, um, and Instagram as well. Recently I've started posting about, um, papers and things on there to see if mm. people are interested yeah so basically you can find if you want to see his youtube videos or the ted ted educational videos you can access them from your your website and there's also some other podcast episode you have done earlier you can take in yeah sure find yeah. Them there. yeah perfect uh, anything else you would like to add in the end is, is your research group for example looking any any collaboration or or anything I'm. I love working with um, people all around the world. I'm involved in some awesome projects, um, but I'm always keen to do more and um, be involved in in other things. So yeah, very happy to collaborate. And if people want to email me, you can just Google my name and it will come up with my institutional email address, and you can go from there. Um, or on the website, there's a contact form. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm really excited. I think these resources and the ones that are about to come out, like the kids' books, they it's like the most excited I've been about any project I've worked on. And I just think I'm like, I wonder what could be next. Like surely this is the peak. <laughs> um, so it's an exciting time. And um, yeah, I'm just really grateful. Thanks so much for having me. And I hope um, I've been, I've been somewhat helpful to the listeners, but I know your comments have been really insightful. So thanks again yeah. for having me. Yeah. Thanks. I think this was, this is really great and great. And it's, it's nice to see how excited you are about project. And I think, I think this can maybe encourage more researchers to do science comms, do this kind of things, children books, whatever it is. And I, I have to say, I also like through this podcast, I, I really like communicating about research and, and also this children project that we are doing with the polar bear animation. It's, it is, it is really inspiring. So maybe, maybe yeah. people can find encouragement from this to actually do more science communication so awesome. thanks for I'm taking the time yeah yeah thank you thank you <laughs>